Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. This is Sohini from South Bay, California and I welcome you today. For anyone who's tuning in for the first time, this is where we talk about everything AI. We talk about machine learning laptops, careers, um, you know, college, university, finding a job, um, dealing with or, or coping with, with rejections, uh, and, and everything you, you need to know if you are in the domain of AI and machine learning. So thank you for joining me today. So today I actually wanted to share with all my, you know, all my viewers and all the people in my community, how humbling and how grateful I am for the latest achievement um, that I've had. So last month I was bestowed with the award for Distinguished Alumnus Award from my alma mater, which is Berlin Institute of Technology, Mesra, where I did my undergraduate degree on engineering in electrical and computer engineering. So this was a, a huge, you know, landmark for me. I, it was completely unexpected. Uh, and it was completely because of, you know, contributions as, as, you know, paper research papers, as, as my patents and along with, you know, with the work that I've done entrepreneurial journey into AI and machine learning. So what I wanted to, to, to share with you today is, um, ever since that happened, I've been getting, uh, you know, a, a lot of, uh, you know, people have been reaching out over LinkedIn and I'm so thankful and grateful for that. But as, you know, some people have been asking about my career journey. You know, how has the journey been so far? Um, you know, some of the tips of, of the trade uh, I've been in the AI and the machine learning field, uh, especially, you know, working for over 10 years now. So what has what has worked for me and what has not worked for me so that's the reason why in this video i'm going to share three of the top tips that i hold extremely you know near and dear to my heart in order to migrate a career in ai and machine learning be it a you know research scientist be it, be it an engineer be it a manager um you know be, be a te technical pro program manager whoever you are if you are related to the AI and machine learning fields, I'm hoping that these tips and these, you know, tips of the trade are, are, are going to really be helpful in, you know, bringing some peace or bringing some, you know, method to the madness, which is a career in AI and machine learning. So if this is of interest to you, please stay tuned. start talking about my career journey as it has been so far. I come from a very small town. It's an industrial town. It's called Tata Nagar. It's in the eastern part of India. And, uh, you know, growing up, it was uh, it was just about studies and, and school and, you know, doctors and engineers. These were the only two careers that you would know, um, you know, in, in, in that in that area. But then I was fortunate enough to go to, you know, BIT uh, Mesra. But during college, I got the right mentorship. I got the right support. I asked the right questions, maybe. Um, so I was able to prepare in order to come for for my master's degree at Kansas State University with a scholarship. So I got a 50% uh, you know, TA and I was able to move to KSU. And my project there was actually epidemiology. And uh, the, the goal was to you know, figure out how an infection spreads at what rate and can you control it? If you have a vaccine, where would you deploy it? And so on and so forth. And then for my PhD, I went to University of Minnesota where I was working with uh, ophthalmologists in order to use machine learning for automated classification of pathology. So I worked on retinal imaging. I worked on uh, OCT, adaptive optics. There was like a slew of uh, uh, ophthalmology, uh, you know, images where I was able to apply, you know, machine learning too. And from there, I transitioned directly as a faculty to University of Washington, um, you know, Bothell campus, where I was working more on my research what lab was called Medical Image Processing Systems Lab. And there I was doing more, you know, CT and MRI imaging, you know, finding the, the, the quality differences between them. Again, and that's where I started using, um, you know, deep learning. And then back in 2017, I made the transition into industry. Uh, after having, you know, three very good successful years as a faculty, I decided there was more out there. So I moved to the Bay Area in, in, in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, into Volvo cars. And that's where we started looking at multimodality. So if you have camera, if you have LiDAR, we started working with this company called Luminar. And they were the first of their kind to be, you know, 15, 15 nanometers. So how would you take Luminar, uh, you know, this high quality LiDAR and merge that or fuse that with, with vision? While I was 
at Volvo Cars, um, again, upskilling was always on the top of my mind. So I actually went back to do my, you know, night classes uh, to get my, uh, you know, certification in, in engineering leadership. So if you call it a, a mini MBA, if you may, and it's by the Sutarja Center at, at Berkeley. So that was a six month program, one of the best time I actually spent there. And following that, I actually entered my entrepreneurial journey. And so this was a company called uh, Fourth Brain. The two courses that I designed was Machine Learning Engineer and MLOps. So, and since, you know, last year, I've actually been in Accenture. AI engineering, uh, uh, lots of, of different projects. So being in uh, in consulting right now, you can actually work through a plethora of, of problems. And again, I'm a mother of a three-year-old. So that's been my career journey so far. As you can see, a lot of change changes, uh, a lot of risky, but calculated risky moves. But that's what I wanted to talk to you today about is what what are some of the things that have guided me, my guiding principles in order to migrate into this uh, you know career of AI and machine learning? So now let's get into sharing the, the top you know, tips and tricks of the trade that I've learned over the years. First off is there is a lot of value in planning. If you are specifically in, in you know, college and you're trying to figure out you know, what is the next job or what's the career path that I should get into, there's always value in being inquisitive and asking the right questions. For me, I specifically started planning that I want to come for my master's uh, to U.S. back in my second year in, in college. And I found friends that I could study with. I found people who I could, you know, loan books from. I learned the importance of a recommendation letter. I learned the importance of a good SOP. So I reached out to for, you know, for people to review my SOP, my, you know, statement of purpose and, and, and do, you know, summer internships uh, unpaid so that I could get good recommendation letters. So for the second, um, you know, tip, I would say it's very important at any stage of life, you should always know what you are good at. You should always play to your strength. So understanding what our strength is, is the, is the key to it. For me, I knew, I realized very really early that I have a stage presence so I can talk. So that was always my strength. So I made sure I could use that wherever, you know, I was moving across jobs uh, or even, you know, planning my career trajectory. And at any time, you should know what your strength is and you should always know what's the next thing that you want to hone in or what's the next skill that you want to hone in. I'll give you an example here. Uh, you know, while I was a faculty, I had a student and he was a Spanish teacher and he'd been a Spanish teacher for a very long time, but he always had a product idea in, in his mind. He wanted to be an entrepreneur. He just didn't have the right skill sets to you know, build the prototype or build the MVP to launch his you know, business. So, you know, when he came to my class, he said, you know, I can talk about it and I can plan it, but I don't know how to create it. And asking me the right questions or, or you know, coming up and, you know, building this, this as, as a part of his capstone project gave him the, the confidence to move on. And now he has, has actually been able to, you know, launch his own uh, company in the in the last year. So that's what he knew his strength was. His, his speech that he could present. And he already had an idea, but he also knew what's the next thing he wanted to do. So having that kind of clarity at you know, various stages of life actually is extremely beneficial. The third uh, you know, thing that I will talk about from my career is there is always a value in calculated risk. So calculated risk, when I was moving from academia to industry, it was a calculated risk. Should I do it? Should I not? I didn't really didn't know about it. Uh, or when I went back to, you know, uh, to MBA to do my mini MBA in order to get that degree, that was another calculated risk moving to management, uh, going into entrepreneurship and then coming to consulting. All of these were calculated risks. Uh, Sometimes, and there is value to, you know, sticking at the same company for a long time. And then sometimes there is value to, you know, moving around and, and finding the next best thing. It's always very necessary to find the balance. Um, I have seen a lot of people who change or jump, you know, jobs in AI and machine learning, maybe every two years or every, you know, one and a half, two years, maximum three years. And then I have also seen people stay at the same company for, you know, eight, 10, 12 years, which is better. I, it, it completely depends on what lifestyle or what life stage you are at. So make sure that you have balance for your personal as well as, or, as your professional journey. If you're changing every few years, that means your career is, is, is having more of your time. You have your, your personal life, your health, your well-being, family has, it's sort of, you know, you don't have to put that much attention to it. So taking calculated risk 
making sure that the four burners of you know health, family, friends, and you know your your overall well being is is taken care of is super important. This is the mantra that I go by is, uh, and this is actually a story that I had uh, heard a few years back, and it just stuck with me. So once there was this, uh, you know, man who passed away and he left all his stuff to his son. And uh, among all of them was actually a watch, an, an old watch. It was an heirloom. So it had been, you know, handed over uh, generation after generation. So it was a very old watch that the guy wore it on, on his hand and he decided to pawn it off. Like it's a very old watch. It stopped working. What should I do? So he took it to a pawn shop. The pawn shop said, I'll give you $5 for it. So you said, no, it's too little. Yeah. So you took it to another pawn shop. They said, you know, we will maximum give you like eight bucks, but not more than that. So it, it's really old. It's raggedy. You have no value for it. So he said, okay, it's just too little. I'm not going to sell it. It's an heirloom. I'll just, you know, wear it for keepsakes. So he would wear the watch, but it, again, it wouldn't tell you time. And it, it was pretty old. So one day he went to a museum auction. And there, the, the auctioneer actually noticed his, his watch. And he said, can I take a look at it? And he said, yeah, sure. And so he took a look at the watch. And it turned out it was it was valued at a half a million dollars because it was that rare. And it actually came from you know the, the German times uh, during World War I. So it, it was an extremely priceless uh, you know, thing that he had. But he went to the wrong people, and they undervalued him. That's very, you know, in, in par with if you are in the AI and machine learning or even in any domain, there will be people who undervalue you, who tell you you're not worth it. Or if you're trying to move, they'll give you a, a random reason for rejecting you and saying, hey, you don't have this X, Y, Z. This is exactly what we are looking for. If that happens, don't lose heart. Know that they are just the pawn shop who don't know your value. You are someone who needs to be treasured in a museum with that quarter of or half a million dollar worth. You are priceless in what you do and you are the best at what you do. But from time to time, everybody seeks external validation. And, you know, we get bogged down from time to time. That happens to, to me, to everyone who is at any stage of, of their career. So always hold that true to your heart and say, OK, I am valuable. I know I am very good at the certain thing that I that, that I do. But these people are unable to see my worth just because they are just another pawn shop. So please do leave me some feedback as how you found this video. Did you find it useful? And if I should make a little more motivational videos like this. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And please do post a comment so that I can keep making more of these. Thank you and have a good one. Mm -hmm.